This reading of A Radical Change by Charles Spurgeon is from the Free Grace Broadcaster magazine entitled Conversion, issue number 195, and is produced by Stillwater's Revival Books. A Radical Change by Charles Spurgeon Quote, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. End quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 My line of discourse will be as follows. According to our text and many other scriptures, a great change is needed in any man who would be saved. And this change is recognized by distinct signs. In order to salvation, a radical change is necessary. This change is a thorough and sweeping one and operates upon the nature, heart, and life of the convert. Human nature is the same to all to all time, and it will be idle to turn to try to turn the edge of scriptural quotations by saying that they refer to the Jews or to the heathen, for at that rate we shall have no Bible left to us at all. The Bible is meant for mankind, and our text refers to any man of any country and any age. Quote, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. End quote. We prove this point by reminding you, first, that everywhere in Scripture, men are divided into two classes, with a very sharp line of distinction between them. Read in the Gospels, and you shall find continual mention of sheep lost and sheep found, guests refusing the invitation and guests feasting at the table, the wise virgin, virgins and the foolish, the sheep and the goats. In the epistles we read of those who are, quote, dead in trespasses and sin, end quote, from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and of others of whom it is said, quote, and you hath he quickened, end quote, from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, so that some are alive to God and others are in their natural state of spiritual death. We find men spoken of as either being in darkness or in light, and the phrase is used of being brought, quote, out of darkness into his marvelous light, end quote. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Some are spoken of us having been formerly aliens and strangers, and having been made fellow citizens and brethren. We read of, quote, children of God, end quote, in opposition to, quote, children of wrath, end quote. We read of believers who are not condemned, and of those who are condemned already because they have not believed. We read of those who have, quote, gone astray, end quote, and of those who have, quote, returned to the shepherd and bishop of their souls, end quote, from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. We read of those who are, quote, in the flesh and cannot please God, end quote, from Romans chapter 8, verse 8, and of those who are chosen and called and justified, whom the whole universe is challenged to condemn. The Apostle speaks of, quote, us which are saved, end quote, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, as if there were some saved while upon others, quote, the wrath of God abideth, end quote, John chapter 3, verse 36. Quote, enemies, end quote, are continually placed in contrast with those who are, quote, reconciled to God by the death of his son, end quote, Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Though there are those that are, quote, far off from God by wicked works, end quote, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, and Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, and those who are, quote, made nigh by the blood of Christ, end quote, from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. I could continue till I wearied you. The distinction between the two classes runs through the whole of the scriptures, and never do we find a hint that there are some who are naturally good and do not need to be removed from the one class into the other, or that there are persons between the two who can afford to remain as they are. No, there must be a divine work making us new creatures and causing us all, causing all things to become new with us, or we shall die in our sins. The Word of God besides so continually describes two classes, very frequently and in forcible expressions, speaks of an inward change by which men are brought from one state into another. I hope I shall not weary you if I refer to a considerable number of scriptures, but it is best to go on the fountainhead at once. 
This change is often described as a birth. See the third chapter of the Gospel of John, which is wonderfully clear and to the point. Quote, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. End quote. This birth is not a birth by baptism, for it is spoken of as accompanied by an intelligent faith which receives the Lord Jesus. Turn to John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Quote, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, end quote. So that believers are, quote, born again, end quote, and receive Christ through faith. A regeneration imparted in infancy and lying dormant in unbelievers is a fiction unknown to Holy Scriptures. In the third of John, our Lord associates, associates faith and regeneration in the closest manner, declaring not only that we must be born again, but also that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We must undergo a change quite as great as if we could return to our native nothingness and could then come forth flesh from the hand of the great Creator. John tells us in his first epistle, chapter four, chapter five, verse four, that quote, "whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world." End quote. And he adds to show that the new birth and faith go together. Quote, "This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith." End quote. To the same effect is first John chapter five, verse one. Quote, "whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God." End quote. Where there is true faith, there is the new birth, and that term implies a change beyond measure, complete and radical. In other places, this change is described as a quickening. Quote, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. End quote. From Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We are said to be raised from the dead together with Christ, and this is spoken of as being a very wonderful display of omnipotence. We read of, quote, the exceeding greatness of his power to us, to us word we who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised them from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, end quote, from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Regeneration is a very prodigy of divine strength and by no means a mere figment fabled to accompany a religious ceremony. We find this change frequently described as a creation, as, for instance, in our text, quote, if any man be in Christ, he is a new cre creature, end quote. And this also is no mere formality or an attendant upon a rite, for as we read in Galatians chapter 6, verse 15, quote, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision Circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. End quote. No outward rites, though ordained of God Himself, affect any change upon the heart of man. There must be a creating over again of the entire nature by the divine hand. We must be quote, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. End quote. From Ephesians chapter two verse ten. And we must have in us, quote, the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, end quote, from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. What a wonderful change that must be, which is first described as a birth, then as a resurrection from the dead, and then as an absolute creation. Paul, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, further speaks of God the Father and says, quote, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. End quote. John calls it a, quote, passing from death unto life, end quote. First John chapter 3, verse 14. No doubt having in his mind that glorious declaration of his Lord and Master, quote, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John chapter 5 verse 24. Once more, as if to go to the extremity of forcible expression, 
Peter speaks of our conversion and regeneration as our being, quote, begotten again, end quote. Hear the passage, quote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, end quote. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. My dear friends, can you conceive of any language more plainly descriptive of a most solemn change? If it be possible with the human tongue to describe a change which is total, thorough, complete, and divine, these words do describe it. And if such a change be not intended by the language here used by the Holy Spirit, then I am unable to find any meaning in the Bible. And its words are rather meant to bewilder than to instruct which, God forbid, we should think. My appeal is to you who try to be contented without regeneration and conversion. I beseech you, do not be satisfied, for you never can be in Christ unless old things are passed away with you and all things become new. Further, the scriptures speak of this great inner work as producing a very wonderful change in the subject of it. Regeneration and conversion, the one, the one the secret cause, and the other the first overt effect, produce a great change in the character. Read Romans chapter 6, verse 17, quote, But God be thanked that we were in the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, end quote. Again at verse 22, Quote, now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and in the end everlasting life. End quote. Mark well the description the Apostle gives in Colossians 3, verse 9 and 10, when having described the old nature and its sins, he says, quote, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. End quote. The book swarms with proof texts. The change of character in the converted man is so great that, quote, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. And as there is a change in character, so there is a change in feeling. The man had been an enemy to God before, but when his change takes place he begins to love God. Read Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Quote, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present, present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. End quote. Footnote of unreprovable pertaining to one who cannot be accused of anything wrong. It's blameless. End footnote. This change from enmity to friendship with God arises very much from a change of man's judicial state before God. Before a man is converted, he is condemned. But when he receives spiritual life, we read, quote, There is therefore no now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. End quote. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. 